Hello YouTube and welcome to episode 10 in my Review Starlight reaction series. Back here again with another episode of Review Starlight. Coming off a banger couple of episodes last week, in particular shouting out episode 8, which I thought was spectacular. And yeah, re ready to sit down and watch another one for sure. There was also a fair few YouTube comments from last week, which is which is cool. I like the YouTube comments a lot. A lot of them are very long too, so we're going to try to make our way through them at a relatively brisk pace. But um, But yeah. Thank you for all commenting. I know it was a bigger week last week for episodes and talking and understanding ideas. So makes a lot of sense that the episodes will be here like this. One thing that I've just noticed has changed is that YouTube is seemingly doing their little, uh, that you know how everyone's going to get an at now. I, I don't understand why. Um, so when I say names, I'm obviously not going to say the, the numbers after the names because I think even my name on YouTube now has some weird numbers after it if I've got an at. Um, so I'm going to say Bonanoop. And for the names that are a little bit too weird, I may click into their uh, YouTube channel profile and just see what, what they want to be known as. just makes it very inconvenient for me and shows your, your ad on screen. That's very strange. So again, starting with Bonanoop. Um, just, yeah, compliments. I like compliments. Uh, but the ninth episode's ED is pretty unique and has different lyrics. A uh, small thing, but it highlights the relationship between Juna and Nana and how it's different from the rest of the cast. It's also musically, like, literally the second part of the song, so symbolically we're moving on at the end of episode nine, so makes a lot of sense. Big long old comment by Mo Tamo here. Um, clearly very passionate about the two episodes, uh, with eight being their favorite. So yeah, I think a lot of the comment goes into the context behind the different reviews and the different words that we use to describe certain characters. There's goddesses of certain emotions as well um, that, again, are very clearly pointed towards certain characters. Uh, again, we've talked about solitude as it pertains to Hikari wanting to isolate herself, and then in a similar way, Banana wanting to isolate herself or isolating herself in the process of doing uh, something a little bit weird with the time loops, obviously. Um, but yeah, like, everybody else wants to move on. I want to go back. That's an isolation. That's a solitude point, I think. And again, talking about how our man characters relate to both Claire and Flora, from memory, that's their names, um, will their story end the same way? We're going to have to wait and see. I like this line as well. So Banana may be lost in that review of solitude with Hikari uh, because she chose to stay on the path of solitude, where Hikari chose to... Again, Starlight with you, um, which is very much not solitude and probably a good lesson overall in society. So succeeded and got her glimmer back as a result, uh, remembered what her glimmer was originally based around, uh, which is all very gay. But um, but yeah, it's good. Recreate is my favorite song in the show. I believe that's Hikari's song from episode eight as well. Nana's VA cried during it. I don't like upon first hearing it. That's kind of fun i like that the review of bonds was the one in episode nine uh again talking about karen's bond with hikari and her passion and drive coming from that kind of in an opposite way to episode eight uh and uh banana you know the passion about the 99th year and that performance and that whole thing right some bonds make some characters stronger some bonds make other characters potentially stagnate and not improve and Karen's definitely improved over the process potentially this is also demonstrating to Nana uh, the benefits of moving on calling Nana an antagonist as well I definitely feel like the the giraffe is the major antagonist here I feel right like the toxic side of competition and seemingly moving around all these different schools and granting wishes and wanting to see like again the embodies the will of the audience that makes the audience kind of the bad guys for continually pushing on this competitive narrative between theater performers when that's probably not what it's about if we're going to look at the series from a way wider lens uh then yeah but yeah i mean nana had some stuff that wasn't great but she's gotten over it and it's clearly she she had her heart in the right place i feel along the whole entire journey i, I could never call her the villain i don't think yeah and this is where we get each of our girls and and what um kind of that quote and the goddess and the the, the, the stage play and the starlight um, means for each of them. Juna, obviously passion into fury. Her passion to become the great stage girl and uh, kind of just coasting through life found this new passion. 
fury about not being able to reach the tops of the best, right? Mahiru affection into jealousy, again very obvious, affectionate towards Karen based on previous experiences, turning into jealousy when somebody else rolls along and potentially steals her her glimmer. There, I think there's a line later from another comment about, um, I remember that line in Mahiru's episode pointed at Hikari, right? Don't steal my glimmer, right? And of course, Hikari is going to have some feelings about that, which makes her reaction to that scene um, a little bit more meaningful, I think. Kariko, bravery into escape. So she's very confident in, in that side of it, right? But starting to escape from that, uh, her responsibilities, position, passion, promise. Futaba calls it out. That's a lot of that arc. Futaba's faith into curse. So faith in Kariko turning into a curse when Kariko starts being a little bit of a lazy bitch. But yeah, pro probably the hardest to put the finger on. I, I think that's probably the correct read according to me as well. Nana is hope turning into despair. Not the Danganronpa reference, man. Man. I want a new Danganronpa game bad. But anyway, this is a side tangent. But again, very obvious one for Nana. I think I don't even really need to go into it. Karen is pride into arrogance. Her pride of being a stage girl turning into arrogance when she thinks she could become a stage girl. She decided without the same drive, passion, and effort. It's about drive. It's about power. Um, she needs to listen to that song, I think. And yeah, a whole bunch of extra info here, including funny draft poses, uh, the meaning of Rondo, 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 which I think somebody else mentions again later as well. Oh, but this is some good stuff here. Um, so the reason why it feels so fast between 7 and 9 is because Seven's events actually take place between kind of episode 1 and 2. So yeah, that's probably Banana looking down at Hikari as she exits school, you know, when she turns her head really creepy-like. Um, that's probably during that part of it. Oh, I want to make you part of the show, and then gets to working on that script change. Okay. It's a little bit better. But yeah, long comment, clearly lots of passion about the two episodes. Next comment here, Marionette. I'm quite sure that the only reason Hikari remembered her promise to Karen was because Nana's stage of destiny enabled this opportunity, which also makes me speculate whether or not Hikari would have given up on stage acting had Nana never been the top star causing the chain of events, which is an interesting coincidence, but it's that's also storytelling. Hikari's cape changed from red to blue, across the different audition processes in both London and Tokyo, uh, symbolizing a second chance, a change potentially. And yeah, obviously the, the link between the length of the blade and the glimmer, um, which becomes evident through when she gets the glimmer back, the blade starts going crazy and doing random shit. And yeah, the, the probably the first allusion to it among many. The production team, very proud of episode eight, I think rightfully so as well. I think it's an amazingly produced episode. Uh, but yeah, the production issues become more apparent, particularly in today's episode. So the expectation is set. It's not going to hopefully detract too much from the experience. I'll obviously point it out if and when I see it. But uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll see how it manifests. Next comment here by Ryan. Yeah, this is the one that talked about Rondo. Rondo means a piece of music that uses the same melody over and over with only small changes. So of course, relate that to Nana. And then when we hear that kind of... Uh, the, the, the background music at the end of episode 9, same name, Rondo, 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 relating to Banana, relating to Banana's themes. Also, Futaba is the goddess of curse. Uh, in the Japanese, her role, uh, Jubaku, means confinement due to curse. So I'd say the goddess of confinement is a more fitting term for her. So yeah, in terms of connection to Kariko, of course, as well, confined by what we have going on. This was a piece of symbolism that I really liked from episode 8 as well. The upside down tower, which kind of falls out of the tower and then crashes into the water. And yeah, there's a load of different interpretations you can make for it, right? We've kind of got that Tokyo Tower connection in a number of very interesting and varied ways for both Karen and Hikari, from the slippery dip to the white scenes where they're back to back, where the tower's kind of over the top, from the dream about Tokyo Tower when Hikari's about to show up, from from everything, right? So having Tokyo Tower uh, symbolically represented again uh, during this moment when you regain that glimmer, when you remember what it's all about, i.e. Karen, makes a lot of sense. So yeah, it falling down, potentially creating a wedge, you will have to fight her someday as well. Loads of interesting stuff going on visually with this show. I like this little detail as well, kind of the, the dagger in position zero looking a little bit like Tokyo Tower as well. And yeah, just this last quote here as well. Starlight is a tragedy that will definitely end in separation. 
yeah, and we're using a tower as symbolism for a whole bunch of stuff with uh, Karen and Hikari. We've got at pretentious name, which is Bamps, which is funny. I like that. <laughs> As three comments here, back to back to back. Oh snap, the loss of Glimmer mechanic would explain why those kids dropped out last episode. Potentially, again, I'm I'm not privy to it, but somebody else could probably speak better on that. Hikari not remembering the passion behind the promise seems to, like it's related to her loss of Glimmer. That, as they have gone forward, and Karen reinforcing those promises being what helps her regain her Glimmer. I totally see Karen winning and only picking a small star, that little bit of happiness she can give everyone by sharing. So yeah, taking that small star, big star stuff a little bit more literally um, than I'm probably taking it at this point. Maybe there is a small star and a big star. I don't know where you can literally pick them. I don't know. What, what do you pick to get the wish? Because I want, I want the wish. Either way, Claire Allen's next comment here. I find Nana to be a very interesting character. At her core, she's a kind and loving person, but in my opinion, also a bit arrogant and extremely desperate. I mean, okay, I just find that to be compelling character writing. I don't know, like, flaws attract me to characters in a weird way, right? So, so Banana's all well and good. Banana being, like, a cute, perfect little bean person that just does everything right, um, that's cool. I like that. I like that for Banana. But this extra layer is only strengthened what I think about her, right? I do think a little bit of it comes from I know best, so it, despite what everybody else says, I'm going to take control and, and really like r run shit. I'm not take anybody else's opinions into account, or at the very least, uh, discard them, right? Hear them, discard them, and move on. Um, that's, that's why we like characters with flaws, because they can grow from said flaws. So after losing twice to both Karen and Ikari, respectively, we have that conversation with Jonna, right? And she starts to understand the other's point of view a little bit more, and how, hey, maybe maybe I wasn't so different all along, maybe I actually was displaying qualities of a stage girl. Yeah, this probably says it best. It feels like her flaws are still tied very closely to the love that she has for her friends. Kind of like two sides of the same coin. So yeah, <laughs> misguided. Let's say misguided, right? I love the scene with Nana and Juna at the end, especially like that line, I've never seen you this happy before, has quite a lot of weight to it. Nana has known Juna for decades, presumably, and only sees her, her happiness once the reenactments are over, demonstrating that, hey, beyond what we have going on, there may even be greater happiness and, and stuff, right? Like the person, your roommate, the person that's probably closest to you in the show, displayed a level of happiness not yet seen directly after I stopped what I was doing. Does that give you pause about what I was potentially doing? Yeah, it's a pretty hopeful ending to uh, that little banana arc, let's say. I believe this is M. Marsh with the next comment here. Um, it's worth checking out the three OVAs for the anime. So yeah, I, I misspoke last week. So I'll probably check out the OVAs, just not the chibi shorts, because, you know, it's like the Sympho Gear ones where it'll be just, you know, slice of lifey stuff. And I like slice of lifey stuff quite a bit. As long as they don't bore me to tears, I'm, I'm pretty happy about it. Yeah, this was the commenter that said it as well. The Mahiru don't steal my glimmer from me line from five has a very different kind of tone to it now, right? Along with the metaphorical Karen being the cause of the change by i.e. relationship to Hikari, right? There's also kind of a very literal meaning to it, right? Where, hey, <laughs> Karen chose, made that decision to jump down and stop that fight because if Juna just beat Hikari, then Hikari would probably like lose her a glimmer or whatever or lose it even more and then probably just drop out it was only upon karen uh you know doing this thing that it caused the domino effect of other changes to a bunch of other characters and kind of that that's your butterfly effect point which changes the loop completely and ruins everything for banana and evoli ravioli last comment here uh excited for 10 um two specific girls get a more screen time uh, uh again i would imagine it'd be Yamaya and Claudine, right? That would make a lot of sense to me. Um, and again, talking about maybe some production issues with the episode. And again, shouting at the OVAs, that'll be a pretty good time. Maybe adding a little bit more of that gay into the show too, which we enjoy so much. Congrats on 500 subs. Thank you very much. Yeah, we're, we're, we're trucking along. It's good. I like it. So I have episode eight and nine recap here. And again, I don't know how much of this going forward is going to be that relevant because they kind of closed the loop on the whole banana stuff. Just put it this way, this kind of stuff with 
uh, the actual plot of the Starlight play will be important because it's indicative of later stuff, I think. And you would think a lot of the Karen and Hikari connections forged between episodes 8 and 9 right, the re-emphasis of that central relationship to the show would continue to be relevant into the show's, or at least the TV anime's, final moments. Is the anime going to finish the same way that Starlight the Play does? Only time will tell. I'd imagine we have our own little spin on it. Um, and production's a little all over the place, which we'll probably see in full effect this episode. Uh, yeah, I think we should just jump right in. I don't think there's much else here in the recappy stuff that needs over attention overly long attention i guess i would say um so if you like the video consider liking the video if you like the video and you want to see more consider subscribing to the channel comment anything you thought about the episode anything i could do to improve my presentation comment below i'm doing follow for follow on twitter so follow me on twitter if you'd like me to follow you back and the discord join discord love discord 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 and yeah, jumping into episode 10 right now. Rightio, got episode 10 up here ready to go. Let me pop that up there. Uh, 24 minutes and 7 seconds on this one, so sync up accordingly. As always, there will be a picture-in-picture -picture version provided in the description below. Just going to give it a 3, 2, 1. Rightio. 3, 2, 1, go. About what? Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, by regaining that glimmer. Starlight with you. Big old grudge match, I reckon. All right, cool. Arr. We're not going to mention it at every opportunity, but that opening scene was literally just like very similar to the that first part of the opening. It was just something falling as we had dialogue. Okay. Arr. And yeah, it's kind of just like Hikari talking about a bunch of stuff that we already knew as our lead into Claudine Meyer stuff, which is the, the implication from that leaderboard. I've got the heater on too. I, I don't know if it's going to get too hot. Which it does sometimes because look what it's a very enclosed room with the heater. Because it was cold today, but you know, I'm wearing a t shirt, it can't be that cold. Again, Australia cold. Um, Australia cold is very different to uh, America cold and Europe cold. Yeah, right. What do you mean? It's true. Kind of like I did before. Sounds like a quote. Oh. Oh yeah, kind of continuing on the quote thing from, from the end of the last episode. Yeah, you could join a sweep. She's going to make it. What you cooking? What am I looking at? Some kind of stir steamed dessert. Yeah. Carico sweep. <laughs> Just kiss.
So they don't have access to the leaderboard, obviously. So they're just like, hope I did good. Not many people living, living, oh my god, not many people uh, beating Tendo in this, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, mum will get mad. Bit nervous. Well, I mean, she's just a bit of a grot, honestly. <laughs> uh, my hero sweep. Oh, the sound effect. Yeah, go play outside, kids. Love the sweater around the um around the waist there. Style icon. You seem really happy about it. Oh, baton shit. Yes, hello, Claudine. What you humming? Yeah, she's already in. She always is. Don't act like you don't love it. Well, that was cute. Like seeing what she's like before and after in her vision. Starlight door. Yeah. What else? Mm hmm. Indeed. Claudine Sweep. Oh, we're going back to the aquarium. Oh, yeah, we've got kind of like a day off, like chill day. Oh, because she made the connection from episode four. Four? Feels like a four. Oh, they finally get to see the um the Tokyo Tower one, too. Did we? I forgot. I was just worried if you would remember. Um... Yeah. Mm-hmm. You guys stretching. When? Oh. Thoroughbred's a weird term. Yeah, she's pretty good. You hug under that waist. Is that a clockwork orange poster? What am I looking at? Reborn? Hmm. I think the plot has other ideas, but sure. I don't think she's ever thought that. You are very vexing. Oh yeah, this is where they got like the hair clips and stuff, right? Yeah. What? What is it? Some kind of light.
No. Okay. That's when we made that promise. Oh, cute. And then opposite? Yep. Gotcha. Well, not changing at all is bad, too. Interesting. Okay, I've got a fair bit to say about that part. What onlookers? What, that saw them holding hands? It's okay. Nothing wrong with that. Okay. Yep. What else? Okay. Is it time to go? I think it's time to go. I don't need you to tell me that I got a thing. Becoming we together with me. Is she going to disappear? Jona? Oh. Everyone's gathered in. It's so weird seeing more than like, yeah. What am I looking at? What in the class trial is this? Okay. Oh, well, so we just cut everyone else. No more sweeps. Review duetto. Okay. Indeed, I just said that. What are, what are the teams? Hmm, I don't know. What are the teams? Oh! She threw a Pokeball. Okay, so I like that we put that in uh, Maya's hands. What does choose mean? Does choose mean teammate? What? I'm going home. <laughs> Is she me? Could to go lie down. I could never do the... I could never snap the chopsticks like that. I mean, Banana's sitting pretty. She's won like 60 of these in a row. Legacy signing. Ah! I don't like looking at that. Okay. Alright, is there no shenanigans? I think it's just going to be a genuine 2v2 with, with the people that you think should be in the 2v2. There's going to be a fuck ton of um, lyrics then. Like a fuck ton. Yes, indeed. Yeah, what else? Love. Love. 
I like that kind of team intro. That was good. Okay. The second seat. Whatever you say. All right, this looks kind of neat. I love the lights. Someone's moving something heavy out there. I'll deliver my brilliance onto you. Destiny? It's been a lot of destiny talk. Okay, so if one person loses their cloak, both lose. Who's going to take the L then? <laughs> I shouldn't make noises like that. Oh, the determination. I like the eyes. It's got that little pipsqueak little weapon. She's good with the dagger, though. She's just like a rogue. I gotta get the colors for who the who's singing each, right? Bro. My and Claudina goats, bro. Just holding hands, nothing, nothing too gay. Oh, okay, they're like in sync. Okay, what is occurring? I need to talk about, yeah, who, whose stage is this? Or is it just like, this whole stage thing is somewhat irrelevant because there's so many girls. All right, what what does the crowd think? Oh, they're just watching on. It's giving me like Pokemon vibes. Like they're just like watching the battle go on. What do you think in big boy? Not much. Okay. Oh, I like it. It's kind of like um, like drama club equipment that they're all like kind of jumping on. Oh my god! It's yeah. It's kind of they're kind of transitioning between both sides of the fight. Mmm. Indeed. Mm-hmm. There's so much gayness. All right, what are we doing? Formulate a plan, you two. Is hand-holding the plan? Oh yeah, similar to um in the yeah gotcha, in the kind of souvenir shop. All right, kind of swapped partners there. Whoa! Oh, leap of faith. Okay, that's cool. All right, winning. Let's go, chat room. No way, not Maya. Yeah, I mean, this was expected. Let's be honest. 
two people saying position zero feels wrong. A review duetto. Well, what do you think happens now? What? Uh, okay. Uh, okay, show. No, but she has, though. Uh, uh, uh. This is really good. Okay. Yeah. My Maya would never lose here. In the French, too. What? What do you mean? No, you're supposed to say the opposite thing. Yeah, I guess losing, <laughs> if you take it that way, you never lose. I've never lost, I've just delayed winning. Think about it. The French is an interesting choice. Okay, you two. Is this not a dream? <laughs> Someone's got to let me know if the French is good or bad, because I have no indication. Uh, a new kid at the school? No. Yeah. Yeah, there's two of you left, huh? Oh, review of tragedy. <sighs> yeah, fight to the death. No weapons, bare hand, fist brawl. Yeah. Push her down the stairs. Actually, don't do that. <laughs> That'd be bad. You will we together with me. Someone's got to let me let me in on the translation on that one. Oh, I won't let them do the same thing that they did to me to you. What? Oh. You got got. I thought it was going in the opposite direction. Did she get me too? I'm so confused. Okay. Okay. I don't really understand that. I thought it was leading in the opposite direction. I thought it was going to be like, so I can't see this happen to you. But isn't this going to lead to the same thing happening to her? Did she lie? Am I stupid? I gotta reread that last part. I feel like I'm going insane. I mean, okay, the most noticeable thing with the production in that episode was just, like, the pace of everything was a little bit glacial in the start. I'm like, let's go. Once we got to the action, it was dece, I thought, once we got to the um the actual review. But then again, I like, it, it's, it's happened with two kind of sets of characters meeting and conversing that I just didn't really understand. So I thought the Claudine thing leads to... Like her being like, no, no, Maya would never lose. My Maya would never lose. Would lead to Maya walking up and saying, no, 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 I actually am human. Blah, 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 blah. Right? And then we're shattering that illusion. Um, the illusion that Claudine made about Maya herself. Um, but no, nah, she's just kind of like, no, nah, I never lose. I just delay winning. Um, 
And then, yeah, I just don't understand what you two were up to at all up on that podium. I'll need to reread it. Hmm. Yeah, and jumping into a little bit of analysis on that episode, and we're back. Um, I kind of re-watched the last little bit of the scene there to try to get a little bit of a better read, and I'm still a little bit, um, what's the word? Surprised. Let's say surprised. I was going to go with gobsmacked, but that seems a little bit dramatic. So I think it's meant to be uh, come out of nowhere and be weird, right? Because it seems like it's leading up to a self-sacrifice still for me, right? I can't let them... I can't let them steal your glimmer, thus I will let myself go, cut my own cape off, and let you do whatever you want with it, right? Which makes me think that Hikari must have some kind of plan. It wasn't a betrayal. There must be some kind of plan around the wish and what happens there that will change things. And that is for next episode for us to figure out, right? I think it's meant to be surprising. It's not meant to you know, make sense immediately, which is what I hopefully think is happening, right? I didn't really read through the Claudine stuff again yet. Um, where I thought that scene was going versus where it actually went is strange. <laughs> but again, defying convention isn't, you know, it doesn't have to be bad. <laughs> it's just, it's just needs a second look from me to try to figure out what they're actually going for. But yeah, I mean, the, the the connective tissue between this episode is that its pace is a little bit slow as a result of its production being a little bit, what's the word, bad? <laughs> yeah, bit bad probably. Um, it's still not horrendous, but it's noticeably even a step down from nine, which I thought was already a little bit on the rougher side. Just yet consistent productions on um, anime, original stuff um, that is very ambitious potentially overly ambitious, um, is a tale as old as time, right? I, I mentioned One Day Egg Priority um, in the previous week's episode, I believe. It's giving me One Day Egg Priority. Not that bad. <laughs> Not that bad. But same areas, I think, which is disappointing. But again, I kind of got warned about it before going in. So at least I wasn't as surprised as the people who watched it whilst airing. So yeah, let's jump into the recap a little bit here. Episode 10 starts with Hikari talking about how much Karen means to her and stuff and becomes a major important thing in the episode. That's kind of the before the credits part where the, I don't even know what you call it, like the gold part is flying through the air. Um, again, probably a preview to the end of the episode where, you know, Hikari sends Karen's gold thingo flying. That would make sense to me. Um, it's the last day of auditions and all the girls are excited for their last chance. Remember, they don't get a last chance, most of them anyway. There's no Kariko sweeps. There's no Mahiru sweeps. There's no Juna sweeps. Um, it's going to be same old, same old boring top four. Boo. So how do, how do our top four spend their days? Maya and Claudine spend the day practicing while Karen and Hikari spend the day reinforcing that connection again, right? Those personal connections to these places, to that original promise, to all that kind of stuff, right? Um, which practice ends up, you know, helping each party the most? Think about it that way, maybe, right? The interpersonal connection between Karen and Hikari is probably what led to their victory, um, them working as one entity uh, rather than Karen, rather than Karen, rather than Claudine and Maya working as two separate, very powerful entities. Either way, uh, we go to the underground theater and the draft has put on the Revue Duet. Um, I thought we we're going to do some fuckery um, where we're going to switch up our, our duets that we think would happen or the pairings that we think would happen, right? And I think all I could say about this part without reading the song is that they just kind of fight. There's no real big stage stuff going on. There's no effects, really. There's not even that much dialogue during the fight. It's just fighting. And the fighting is pretty good. It's probably the best produced part of the episode, but um, it's not really what I liked about the reviews. You know what I mean? I liked that there were a little bit more... There was more going on, right? Think about Mahiru. It's got the weird baseball thing going on and the cutouts and the the, the, I'm the background character and all that kind of stuff. And even, even the weird intro where she's doing the voice for Karen and the voice for, for Mahiru as well. It, I mean, I don't know. It just felt a little bit on the safe side to me. 
And yeah, I've kind of gone through this last bit already. We'll see what these reasons may be leading into the future, I think. Uh, what do I have down here? I just kind of highlighted the production stuff, which is probably the most notable part of the episode outside of that ending, I think. Um, if you were, so, so say you go into a thread after this episode ends airing, right? What is the first thing people are going to talk about? Probably not the ending, but probably the production stuff. It is the most noticeable part of the episode for mine. But yeah, we're going to have another look through here and see what we can see regardless. Yeah, kind of the intro here, Hikari recounting that she was thankful that Karen remembered the promise all this time as well. It was equally important to her as it was to, to me, uh, which is a comforting feeling for sure that we're on the same level. And again, this feels like the prelude at the start of the episode, alluding to the end of the episode. Uh, even the same line is repeated. I'm thankful that you let me, you know, I lost my glimmer, but you let me be reborn as a stage girl. That line comes up again at the end as well. We could starlight together. That's why. And we get the ending there. Quick look at the, you know, final four who will be fighting today. Yeah, I, I, I think the, the that's why is leading into the decision Hikari makes at the end of the episode as well. So we kind of just check in with most of the main cast and see what they think about the final day of auditions. That's what this part of the episode's all about. We start with Juna and Banana. Of course, Banana would have some special insight into this process, having been through it 60 times already. The best part about this part of the scene is uh, Banana bringing out a quote um, from, I'm guessing, some kind of famous person. Uh, that is apt for the situation, similar to how Juna kept bringing up quotes at the end of um, the last episode, right? Bit of connective tissue between the two episodes, linking uh, Banana and Juna's characters, um, showing progress for Banana. She's now in more of Juna's camp, right, of quoting, and, and sees that as endearing and, and is moving on to new things because she wasn't much of a quoter before. So yeah, nice. I, I enjoy Banana Ice, we could even say. I don't understand what these little dessert things are, though. They, they they seem like a cake or something. They kind of got like the, the cupcake little wrapping things, but she's like steaming them. Can you like steam a cake like that? I'm, I'm not saying it would be bad. It's just unconventional. They call it baking for a reason. You bake. Interesting one. I don't know what these are. Maybe it's a Japanese thing. And again, connective tissue between that scene and the next is now they're enjoying this snack that Banana has made for them, which is nice. I mean, I like... Okay. One thing I like about Karako is that she hasn't really changed. I I think that's a it's a tough one to justify, but but let me try. It'd be very easy for a character like Karako to go through a very childish, I would say childish arc where she discovers the value of like being nice and not being selfish and blah, blah, blah. Like some Sesame Street type shit. But I like that she's still the same old character. She's just got a different focus and a different set of values enforcing these character traits. Um, yeah, so more realistic version of change. People don't change overnight like that, right? Um, to become more humble and... and that kind of thing, right? She was making small steps, and that's important too, like meeting uh, Futaba halfway sometimes, but she's still the same old Karako. That's what I kind of want to get across, and the Karako that Karako fans would like. So, yeah, neither will reveal to each other uh, how many auditions they've actually won, which is funny. So I guess, yeah, they don't get a look at the leaderboard. They, um... They were just assuming based on their win-loss record and what other people would tell other people. So we get these three in uh, the, their, their shared living arrangement as well. Uh, Karen's just chewing on one of those desserts as well, making a mess. Um, Mahiru, also known as Mom, Dorm Mom, uh, she's going to come through and clean everything up. Of course, we also know that Hikari is very messy too. They get kicked out of the house. Kids go play outside. Um, Mom has to do some cleaning. Again, it's the small stuff. It's Karen still being kind of tired. Um, Again, great touch. It's just continuing to reinforce character stuff. It's good. So even, yeah, kind of this nervous biting from Hikari too. So this is with their animation budget or time uh, to animate slashed, obviously, right? And they're still doing these little character flourishes every now and again and, and reinforcing that side of the show. It was clearly an important part, a priority for them to include this kind of stuff, which is... Just good good old anime making, right? Emphasis on character. I talk about it all the time. I do like Mahiru getting her little bit of alone time, right? Um, yeah, just, you know, she's going to clean. She's going to declutter. 
I wish I liked cleaning as much as some people do. Some people find it really therapeutic. And yeah, I think I think Mahiru is one of those people, right? Kind of letting letting the baton with the duster. It's a little bit sad, let's be honest, but um, but I like it. I like it a lot. This was cute too. Okay, so we see how Claudine is with and without uh, Maya, kind of in in view, without her presence around. So sees that she's here and kind of lamenting the fact that she is here a little bit. Like, oh god, here we go. Like, deep breath, let's get ready, time to put on this facade a little bit. So yeah, I can't help but feel like this whole relationship has been kind of pushed to the wayside a little bit. I was way more keen to find out uh, Claudine backstory stuff and a little bit of Maya backstory stuff, right? How are they so driven? What drives them? Uh, we get a little bit of kind of the origins of this connection too, uh, from way back to entrance exams, but... I just don't feel like we dive into it enough. Unless there's more supplementary content for it, potentially we go into it more in whatever form the movie takes. Um, there's still two more episodes of the TV anime as well, so there's still time there to have another look. But um, but yeah, I thought there would be way more stuff here. Way more stuff around the 99th year performance too. What did these two being the leads together look like? Don't know. I, we, we do not know. I don't know, it feels like a missed opportunity unless they do something with it in the future. So again, direct contrast, we're talking about, you know, the top star is the only person that can bring the glimmer to the, you know, performance, blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, aquarium shenanigans with these two <laughs> in kind of, you know, stark contrast to that. Um, yeah, it just shows different priorities in each duet or each partnership, I guess, at the end of the episode, um, how they approach the, their interpersonal relationship between them, if that makes any sense. You know what I'm saying? Like, how is Karen and Hikari different to Claudine and Maya? A number of references to uh, episode four here. So they couldn't get into this aquarium during that episode, right? They tried, but it was closed for cleaning or something, right? Uh, now, this particular spot is important because that's where they got the hairpins and made the promise and did all that kind of stuff, right? Along with also visiting that one aquarium that, uh, that was in the picture that kind of uh, eluded Karen as well. Um, so yeah, now, now we're going to use this opportunity to reinforce that initial connection from way back in the day. So Karen remembers everything. Apparently there's some kind of promise to meet back at this location as well um, that they're fulfilling now. Oh yeah, okay. So this was probably the best use of, um, I guess, budget that I saw. Um, we're just going to show <laughs> these two stretching, right? And we're just going to show, like, Claudine face first into her midsection, you would imagine. You would imagine, you know, that's that's the waist uh, that she's grabbing onto. Um, it's very gay, for sure, but also links into the kind of stretching story about their origins, which we'll get into now. Oh, that, that's a cool connection, too. So between Hikari and Karen and Claudine and Maya, Claudine is also, like, skeptical that Maya would remember this thing between these two, right? So let me set the scene. Claudine uh, thinks she's hot shit. Uh, first day of entrance exams, goes and offers to stretch with uh, Tendo Maya. She accepts, and then Tendo Maya goes on to blow over and out of the water and be clearly the best there, um, putting Claudine in her place a little bit. Claudine, in current day, is a little bit skeptical that Maya would even remember such a thing. But again, this is the constant thing of what, you know, Claudine thinks is a one-sided relationship. Maya is actually interpreting all this in real time as well. She just puts on a little bit of an air of importance compared to Claudine, making it feel like, you know, she's only self-focused when in reality, she's just like everybody else a little bit, right? And, and sees this as a, you know, one of the first people to talk to me during the entrance exams, one of my best friends, potentially more. So yeah, I like this scene a lot. And kind of the the, the connection between... The, the two different relationships shown in this episode of one party thinking the other party forgot about something. Um, mutually recognized importance of things feels good and is important. So of course, Maya being like, of course I remember that. And then Claudine thanking her, right? Putting her in her place, showing her that she wasn't complete and that she needed to go even further beyond. But still emphasizing, okay, so that's the other difference between these two relationships, right? So we have this one that's still staunchly competitive. Like, they end every scene with, but I'm still going to beat you. I'm still going to be number one, by the way. You're, you're toast, by the way. 
um, compared to Karen and Hikari that are always like, let's starlight with you together. We'll both get the, the stage wish tiara thing, right? The philosophy that wins out in the end is interesting as well. What is the best path? We keep using that line, uh, you're really vexing or something to that effect as well, which I'm guessing has a more apt Japanese translation. Back to these two and kind of going down memory lane, um, kind of the same set of lights of Tokyo Tower that they made this kind of promise in front of before. Again, reciting even lines from Starlight, right? Um, the same way they recited lines from Starlight immediately after seeing the performance, like any excited kid would do, um, thinking that they're the leads. And we talk about, hey, have I changed? Have you changed? And we're representing this by uh, adult Karen looking down at uh, little kid Hikari, right? And we do the opposite thing later. Again, like, they both think the same thing about the relationship. And that's what we're getting across visually, which I like. Um, again, it's very, hey, here's a frame. We're going to look from the bottom of the frame to the top of the frame. And that's going to be our shot. Um, no more big epic wave uh, fire sword fighting sequences, <laughs> right? Um, this is what we get now. Hey, at least the imagery is still good. At least the you know it's still well made uh, visually, even if the 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 animation isn't there to back it up. I do like this as well. Okay, this is a layer I forgot. So these two performing this right, and then these two watching, which are them when they were little, right? So the childlike version of us is watching along to see what we're doing now and is happy they're happily watching along this is what they would have wanted this is the the childlike person in all of us uh the hopes and dreams of us when we were very young looking upon our future selves and being proud i think that's what we're trying to get across and i think it does a pretty good job um again inspired good stuff Anytime we show little kids looking at big kids, <laughs> question mark, um, performing and acting, I find it, you know, full of thought and meaning. I think it's good. We hear that notification go off again. We're going to go down to the underground theater and fight. The first thing we, or the last thing we say before it goes off is that we should meet at this location again in the future. So I'm guessing that that'll happen in some point in the show too, in due time. Kind of, yeah, again, panicked uh, Hikari here, using this as a last opportunity to thank uh, Karen, which does not match with what we think is going on at the end if she's actually being ruthless. I think she's got some kind of plan, right? Whatever her wish may be, may be involved in the plan too. Whatever her stage of destiny is. Yeah, for becoming we together with me is, is an interesting line, is an interesting translation. Um, I'm wondering how correct it is. So all the girls that obviously aren't top four, uh, you know, just get a seat. Hey, you guys stay here. You get to watch along. Have fun. You guys all lost. So because we have nine, we need to change our schedule a little bit. We obviously can't have everybody fight the same number of fights because there's an odd number of people. Thus, we need some kind of elimination bracket at the end to determine the winner. That That's the that's why this needs to happen is because we have an odd number. It just wouldn't make sense otherwise. And we're going to set it up as a duet thing. Yeah, a special two-on-two -two performance, a review duet. This really excites Karen. This is exactly what she wants, right? If we win, we can actually Starlight together. This is perfect. Are you stupid? He's obviously going to uh, like pit the, the two that are duetting together at the end, right? It's obviously how this is going to work. Yeah, Hikari questions it, looking down, special treatment. No, we don't get special treatment. So the draft here only says, which stage girl do you choose, right? So I thought we were going to flip things. I thought the person that we chose would have been the person that we're going to fight because the draft is so about competition and that kind of thing. It wasn't about picking your teammate. And I thought that we weren't going to tell the characters that and that was going to end up being a kind of dramatic twist on it all, right? And um, we're going to get some weird matchups, maybe a, a you know, Claudine with Hikari uh, for the end. That would that'd be a little bit weird. Um, I think it would be very interesting, though. Uh, what we end up is 
pretty standard, I would say. I like that we still give the opportunity to Hikari to choose a girl, even though there's only one option. So <laughs> I wonder what would happen if they both chose Claudine. Okay, this is good progress for Karako as well, right? Even if she gets guilted into it. So the old Karako would spit the dummy basically right she would see something like this see that she's not involved and just go home and not participate and not try to improve this shows direct again effort to improve which is all important to her arc that she had going on earlier right actually trying to continue to live up to the name that she had right uh what's the the Tendo Maya line again, something about bearing the weight of expectations or something to that effect. Yeah, but it'll, again, all the other characters kind of convince her. We're all going to watch along and try to get better. Except for Banana. Banana's just kind of watching along. Like, I wonder what they choose. Again, she has no feeling of wanting to get better. She's already done this 60 times. It would be kind of boring if she, she won again. This is a very scary frame of the draft, and I just wanted to kind of talk about it. This is what I see in my nightmares. We also reuse that kind of intro again, which is expected in an episode that had such production issues i think kind of get a new uh duetty intro for these two though in my firmly raised hands a flower of love blooms gracefully even if it must end in tragedy i jump onto this shining stage again these almost feel fourth wally to me these almost feel like outside of the context of the show like are they actually doing this or is this just part of the intro everyone has the same chance to shine this being claudine now so i'll dance my dance of love fiercer than anyone else and fly with my wings of freedom higher than anyone else second seat claudine i am the only star sure the radiance of the moon the love of the stars having gathered a multitude of lights i will now deliver them to your heart tendo maya on this night i will deliver brilliance unto you okay that's just she's based hell yeah and again the stakes of the duet fight if one person loses their cape then it's over right there's no other chance to kind of even the score it's it's sudden death for both people so we start up the review of destiny with the song star divine finale uh which is cool the song i think it feels a little bit generic it feels a little bit like it's not bad or anything it's just a little bit just there it's good the performances are good it's catchy but it just doesn't have the emotion of earlier episodes i don't think or the personality of them even i don't even know what much else to say about the fight itself it's just kind of exists it's good it's well animated they sword fight good there's some nice transitions between uh maya and claudine and them fighting each respective opponent again showing the connection showing that they're on the same page showing how much of a force that they are how much how similar they are in that force as well um yeah, not much else beyond that. I think the stage, the stage being kind of bare, is probably the biggest missed opportunity there. Without time to hesitate, the gears have started turning. Come, summon your determination and raise your sword high. Without knowing how it will end, the review has started. I'll once again recreate myself. When I whispered the wish that died in my heart, a guiding star twinkled. I'm trying to think, figure out which subduet is which right? A star divine shines with a newborn light. Open the path, star divine, to a future you you can't, to a future you can't concede. Okay, not a future you, to a future you can't concede. Let our swords carve the path to glory or victory or something. I forget what it said. Let me read it. Yeah, glory. Good. This is the one part we get for the stage is kind of these things popping up and they reminded me of, so we had it like a drama class in school and they would have these kind of blocks that you just push around that didn't really have a, a back to them because they would be shown on stage and be meant to represent different things. Um, again, I was only ever moving them around because they asked me because uh, I didn't, I never did drum or anything like that. But, um, but yeah, I guess that's the closest connection that I see to anything. It just kind of opens up a path to the top, which is pretty basic considering okay th this color i think it's yellow seemingly is claudine it sounds like claudine again i was find trying to find something a little bit more concrete in the lyrics to maybe like prove who each person was because i'm so bad with voices but that sounds like claudine so yellow claudine we can we can remember that we all have our own desires hidden deep within sparks are flying furiously between the gallant profiles i can't blink i can't turn my gaze away though we may clash i still believe in you at the center of the stage there's only place for one but i'm not alone anymore don't lose star divine don't 
give up on your future. Stand up, Star Divine, however many times you're hurt. Star Divine! That's the name of the song. So yeah, again, a lot of this, maybe, am I stupid? Is the song only just Maya and Claudine? Are they the only people singing right now? And maybe we change that a bit later on. The stage makes us what we are, as we see, you know, Claudine and Maya start to put the foot down a little bit. They're clearly a very strong duo. Here they are, standing at the pinnacle, looking deeply into each other's eyes in a not gay way at all understanding each other's movements deeply. Okay, so another thing I thought the episode should have dived into more and was kind of one of the central things of this relationship um, was kind of Claudine's feeling of I'm always looking up to her, I'm always chasing after you, right? And Claudine thinking that Maya's just looking solely ahead, focused on herself. But no, like, clearly these feelings were reciprocated between the two and there's there's some kind of you know, joy there upon finding that, right? That she considered me a rival the same way I considered her. It wasn't a, it wasn't like a one-sided thing, right? And again, that would have led beautifully into the end of the episode where, where Claudine's like, no, but my Maya, the Maya I see in my mind, the Maya that I'm always chasing towards, that picture of perfection, the picture of the perfect stage girl, her losing doesn't make any sense to me and causes her to break down a little bit more, right? And then Maya has to come in and be like, no, no, I'm human. You have to understand, I was looking back at you in admiration the whole time. I maybe got a little bit lucky uh, with what I had going on as well. But yeah, we don't really do that. We just kind of do something else. <laughs> we we kind of, we set up to do that and then pivot. It's weird. I'll, I'll talk about it in the moment a little bit more. But yeah, scattered as sand through space, a constellation connected by the skies. That's our destiny. That's our instinct. Now, okay, and now we get a bit of Hikari and Karen, right? Because red's definitely Karen's color. I'm becoming me once again. A star divine shines with a newborn light. Yeah, so kind of uh, Claudine and Maya had their little part where they, you know, looked into each other's eyes and figured shit out. Um, Karen and Hikari kind of did a very similar thing where they, you know, just kind of held hands, remembered why they're holding hands, remembered, you know, the holding hands and how that connects to the when they made the promise at the Tokyo Tower place and what they did early in the episode and kind of the holding hands with their past selves too, right? Show the path Star Divine to a future you can't concede. Don't lose Star Divine. Don't give up on your future. And yeah, these two movers, one where the other two, Claudine and Maya, movers to separate equally talented specialists which one's gonna win it's a difference in philosophy stand up star divine no matter how many times you're hurt the stage makes us what we are we see this final clash between claudian and maya as well let our swords carve the path to glory again I was, I was wishing that this song would be a little bit more pointed about specific stuff for the characters but i don't really see it right um it feels more like a song that's consumed outside the context of review starlight um a little bit more general in that way. But yeah, you see Claudine there clearly a little bit worse for wear upon seeing that, right? Like, Tendo Maya can't lose. Lose? I never lose. And yeah, two people saying position zero feels so wrong that, yeah. <laughs> Everything's pointing to, to tragedy for you two, for sure. So Claudine here, willing to sacrifice her own position, right? To protect the honor and allure of the Tendo Maya. Um, again, I really felt like we're going to like the, the, the other thing that I keep saying, but we're not. Like, the tears in the eyes, Tendo Maya hasn't lost, because if she's lost and she's the picture of perfection to me, if she's the goal, then there's even further beyond that I can't fathom right now, and that's soul-crushing. Like, breaking down, my Maya, my Maya hasn't lost, she wouldn't lose. And yeah, going into the French here, somebody's gonna need to tell me if the French is good, but I'll just prefer them to talk in their most comfortable acting language, I think. Because yeah, I, I just don't get it as much here. They might hold back on a, on a language that they're a little less comfortable with, um, not knowing any of the VAs personally, but I would imagine that they're not French. See, like this part here, okay, so, so Maya walks up and says, Exactly, exactly that I haven't lost. No, the, you're supposed to say the opposite, I think, right? I haven't lost. Those two simply starlighted more than us in this review. I haven't lost. I simply just lost this review. I haven't lost, so stand up, Claudine. Okay. So maybe I still take the same interpretation, right? So, again, soul crushing for Maya to be met with, or not Maya, Claudine to be met with Maya's, I guess... 
a lack of her invincibility, right? Some vulnerability there. And then just a little bit of reinsurance from Maya along the way, right? Of, hey, just because we lost here doesn't mean we'll lose again in the future. I'm still, we're still everything that we have said we are up to this point. We just got beaten on the day. I get, yeah, I guess. I, I like my version better, though. With you, I'll be able to fly higher, says Maya, right? You're cute when you cry, my Claudine. Okay, that's sweet. I like that. I guess, okay, the other part is that, again, Maya isn't French. Claudine in the show is French, right? So coming to her level and speaking French to her is probably of some importance and meaning too. Like, there's something in that. There's something in her learning enough French to be able to say this and then applying that in a way that Claudine would appreciate, showing that the relationship is reciprocal and not one-sided. Yeah, okay, I like that choice then. I like the French choice for that reason. And now these two won, and it's all going to be sunshine and roses, right? Just as we say that we pass the auditions, we get risen up to a pedestal. We all know what's happening. The last audition, the review of tragedy, is starting. Of course it's tragedy. Again, representative of um, uh, Claire and Flora um, getting up to the top, thinking that they've made some kind of progress together and then getting invariably separated, right? Um, think about the sharp red color here, right? Think about, uh, you know, which one was it? It was Claire or Flora? I'm forgetting. But the one that gets blinded and falls. That's kind of Karen in this scene, you know? Gets blinded, blindsided, and falls down. Yeah, so is this the tragic element that was foreshadowed? Dunno. Hikari says that she knew it. You know, we can't become stars together. There was only ever going to be one winner. Thanks, Karen, for everything. Remembering the wish, remembering the promise. You were we together with me. We were we were both us. <laughs> Again, I'm still not sure on that line. Your glimmer did a bunch of stuff for me and allowed me to be reborn as a stage girl once more. After what happened in London happened, my relationship with you is what sparked on that glimmer to re-emerge. I thought that we could starlight together, but I can't steal your glimmer. I won't let them steal it, so Karen, and then Merck's Karen. So yeah, again, I think this is alluding to, I've got a plan. I've got something that will involve nobody losing their glimmer again. Because if Hikari just goes on to wish for, like, sick stage girl powers, then she's essentially done the exact opposite of what she just said, which is stealing her glimmer. So there's some kind of plan here, obviously. Also, the show wouldn't make any sense. So it's not it's not a genuine betrayal like that. But again, much like the end of the play, falling down, Kate goes to end on a little bit of red light with Hikari there, saying goodbye, tears in the eyes, again, similar to the play. Where will we go from here? You've, you're clearly in the driver's seat. You will do something, <laughs> whatever that may be. I'd imagine some kind of stage of destiny where she thinks she's doing the right thing. And um, we'll see how that manifests, because these wishes are very powerful. So yeah, today, an episode that was a little bit all over the place. Um, the production was iffy. Um, it went in some directions that I didn't initially agree with, but I think I've come to terms with, and wasn't written in the conventional way that I thought it would be written in. On the other side of that, I think the fight itself was pretty conventional, which is, you know, it's an unconventional type show. I thought it would do something else. But yeah, we're... we're we're set up for our final two episodes, which I'll do in tandem next week and finish it off. Then probably some OVAs, wherever and whatever form they may come in, and then finishing off with the movie. So yeah, that that that's the schedule looking forward. Hikari's cooking. I wonder what she is cooking, uh, but we will discover that next week. In the meantime, if you like the video, consider liking the video. If you like the video and you want to see more, consider subscribing to the channel. Comment below anything you thought about the episode, anything I could do to improve my presentation, comment below. I'm doing follow for follow on Twitter, so follow me on Twitter if you would like me to follow you back, and the Discord. Join Discord, love Discord, 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 Discord. This was Review Starlight Episode 10, and I'll catch you next week for the next two. And uh, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you later.